Let's have a quick look at something that happened last night. Fox News asked that panel of eight who, if they became president, would pardon Donald Trump. Have a look at the body language here. Signed a pledge to support the eventual Republican nominee. If former President Trump is convicted in a court of law, would you still support him as your party's choice? Please raise your hand if you would. President Trump, I believe, was the best president of the 21st century. It's a fact. And Chris Christie, honest to God, your claim that Donald Trump is motivated by vengeance and grievance would be a lot more credible if your entire campaign were not based on vengeance and grievance against one man. And if people at home well, one thing's for certain. My guest this evening, Vivek Ramaswamy, knows his own mind because his hand went straight up and welcome to the program. It's good to be here, Nigel. Very good to see you. So, you've come into this, you've written a couple of books where you've laid out quite a lot of your philosophy. So you're not a complete newcomer to public debate, far from it. You've been writing op-eds for years, for newspapers, etc. But in political terms, yes. you were, in fact, you were called a rookie yes. by former Vice President Mike Pence last night. How did you enjoy the big stage? I enjoyed it tremendously. The two hours went right by. I thought we were just getting warmed up. And, you know, frankly, I took it as a badge of honor that I was actually the subject of most of the arrows that came from both sides of the stage. And it was, it was actually a good opportunity to smoke out some real ideological differences, actually, within the Republican Party. I think they're deep. And I think that I'm going to be the, have to be the person in this race and on the debate stage who smokes that out. Should we fight foreign wars that do not directly advance American interests or not? Should we actually unapologetically advance American interests even when it comes to domestic economic policy in the face of a climate change agenda that I think is fundamentally anti-American at its core? There were real disagreements on that stage yeah, last night, and I think that's what animated much of the debate, which I think is a good thing. For our audience, who is Vivek Ramaswamy? Who are you? Yeah, so I'm not a politician. You're right. My parents came to this country 40 years ago with no money from southern India. I've gone on to found multi-billion dollar companies. I did it while marrying my wife, Apoorva, who's a surgeon at Ohio State. She's a throat surgeon. We're raising our two sons. One is three and a half years old. One is just over a year old. I actually was just with them earlier this afternoon before coming over here. And we did it while following our faith in God. That is what we call in this country the American dream. And I am genuinely worried that that American dream isn't going to exist for my two sons and their generation unless we step up and do something about it. I haven't lived within government. I've founded a biotech company that developed yeah. five medicines that are FDA approved today. One of them is a life-saving therapy actually in kids. I built an asset manager called Strive Asset Management to offer an alternative to the likes of BlackRock and State Street and Vanguard by voting proxies in corporate America's boardrooms, by representing shareholders with a voice that says, get out of politics. Focus well, this on is, this is, And that's I, been most of my career. I'd say in some ways you sound a bit like Donald Trump in 2016, because Trump comes in and says, yeah. hey, I've never been in politics, yeah. I'm self-made, I believe in the American dream. So there's some strong similarities, mm -hmm. I, I thought, yesterday. But it's interesting, you talk about business and success in business. I've, I've been having a huge argument with the British banking industry over the last couple of months. I was debanked because of my political Yeah, I read views. about that. It's yep, remarkable. Yeah, I mean, it's quite incredible that it's happening. But this sort of woke corporatism, it's gone so deep. And it starts in America, then it spreads across the pond. If, yeah. you, if you were president, what could you actually do about it? So let me actually get to the essence of what's going on here. Actually, it start, I think it started across the pond spread over here and then spread no, back. No, we're blaming you. No, anyway. no, no, no. This, this, I'm making a deeper, a deeper point here of history. It started on the other side of the pond long before 1776. See, the old world European view was that the people, the citizens of a nation, cannot be trusted to sort out their differences. It had to be a small group of business leaders and government leaders in the back of palace halls that decide what's right for everyone else at large. So in 1776, in the American Revolution, we fought one in this country to say no to that vision. We the people decide how we're going to address shared challenges from climate change to racial injustice to whatever they may be. That was the foundation of the American Revolution. And so what you're seeing in the rise of this new woke corporatism, the ESG movement, mm, environmental yeah, social yeah. governance factor movement that pervade capital markets around the world like a cancer, 
is a skepticism of that American revolutionary view. They say the people can't be trusted. So if governments aren't going to get it right on climate change, then we, the business leaders, are going to have to step up and fill the void, working with those government officials to do it. And so what's at stake in these issues, it's not just a, a little annoyance of our modern culture. It is that, too. But it reflects a deeper skepticism that citizens can be trusted at all. So, so what can I do as U.S. president? Well, I mean, this gets into a lot of minutia here, but yeah, Biden yeah. has passed a new rule. I think it's an unconstitutional regulation, but it was, it's codified and effectively is the rules as of today that it, investment fund managers no longer have to take into account profit what? as their sole motivation. I don't, I don't, I don't, but they can take into account these other environmental factors. So I would rescind a lot of that damage. On the environmental stuff, I mean, you were very clear on the stage last night that America needs to frack, America needs to be self-sufficient, America needs to be an energy exporter. Yes. And you were very clear on that, and I get that 100%, and I have to say I have a very similar view for what we ought to be doing back in the United Kingdom with that SU. But when it comes to climate change itself, you know, man-made CO2 is leading to ever-rising temperatures and ultimate doom and disaster. You are, are you a denier? on climate change? Where do you place yourself on So I'll just, I'll just state the facts, because a lot of these labels are reductionist, and most people who are using them have no idea what they're talking about. True. So, so are global surface temperatures going up? The answer appears to be yes. Is that related <clears throat> in some way to man-made causes? The answer appears to be yes. Is that anywhere close to an existential risk for humanity? Absolutely not. And in contrast to the climate change agenda, our best approach forward is adapting to the changes in the climate as we always have through not less but more use of fossil fuels and also other forms of energy most notably nuclear energy and so my view is we have to look at the facts if you look at the number of people who die of climate related disasters tornadoes hurricanes mm -hmm. heat waves mm -hmm. it is down by 98 percent over the you last see, century now, watching mainstream media you wouldn't believe you that, would never would know this but, but this fact nobody who's credible on scientific communities familiar with the data will deny this because it's a hard fact for every 100 people who died in 1920, two died today of a climate-related disaster. You want to know why? More plentiful, abundant access to fossil fuels. Eight times as many people die of cold temperatures as warm ones. Let's think about that fact. Oh, and by the way, in the 1970s, the climate change movement was actually about warning of a looming ice age unless we stop I'm old using enough fossil to, fuels. I remember it as a kid. Yeah, well, no, I'm, no, I do. I'm young enough to you see know. the images of the magazines on the internet. They used to warn them. <laughs> but, but the reality is this is from the 1970s, no, not that really long ago. But this gets to the heart of something yeah. else that I think is really important, Vivek, and I think you care about. You've got two kids. You mentioned that yes. earlier. My feeling is, you know, right across the Western world, frankly, our kids are being indoctrinated at school, they're being poisoned they at school. They're not being taught critical thinking, they're not being given both sides of an argument. What would you as president do with education in America? So we have to restore education through putting achievement first. That means getting rid of teachers' unions. If you're a public teachers' union and you're unionizing, who are you unionizing against? It's not against some monopolist capitalist. You're unionizing against the students, the public, that you're supposed to represent. So I would shut down the U.S. Department of Education. It is a disaster. You shut it down? Shut it down. Close it, shutter it. But wouldn't that be just complete Sell chaos? the building? No, 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 it wouldn't be. It wouldn't be. In fact, it would be a great way. <laughs> Who's going to run it? Well, it doesn't need to be run because education in the United States is administered locally, not centrally by yeah. the federal government. So take that $80 billion, that's a lot of money, and put it in the hands of parents, many of whom are poor parents in the inner city that can't afford to send their kids to a properly performing school effectively trapped in a ghetto known as their zip code and I think that is the civil rights issue of our time giving parents the opportunity to send their kids to the best possible school they can mm. by shutting down a bureaucracy that's sapping up money that should be in those parents pockets then I want the public schools to compete but they only compete if there's feet held to their fire the dirty little secret in the United States of America this will shock perhaps viewers in other parts of the world but it's a dirty secret that deserves to be exposed. The schools that spend the most money on a per student basis, some schools in New York, $40,000 yeah. per student per year, are the schools that have the worst achievement results on a per student basis. Just think of it, that's mind boggling. It's not just that you're not getting your money's worth. It's literally the schools that are spending more yeah. are doing an absolute terms worse than the schools that are actually doing and much some more would argue, And some would argue, that those that are doing worst in the education system in America are those from the black communities, that there is huge racial injustice. We saw the Black Lives Matter movement, which 
I have to say, I recognise as a Marxist force when it first arrived. Yes. But how do we deal with this? Do we... Is positive discrimination, is making sure that a company employs a certain number of black people or Asian people, is that the way forward? No. The right way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. John Roberts said it famously in the Supreme Court 25 years ago, it's every bit as true today. Here's the answer. Economic empowerment across the board. I mean, the thing I'm talking about in terms of shutting down the Department of Education, putting that money in the hands of parents, well, you know who's going to benefit from that? A lot of kids in the inner city. And a lot of kids in the inner city, they do happen to be black. I don't think racial discrimination explains the differential in outcomes. You know what I think it does today? Fatherlessness. So any kid, regardless of their skin color, yeah. if they grow up in a single parent household, are eight times more likely to end up in jail, multiple times more likely to end up in poverty or on drugs, regardless of your skin color. We see exactly the same in British cities. I mean, this is, this is true for most of human history. So now let's just change the prism and see, okay, well, it turns out 45% of black kids are born into single family households, whereas it's like 8% or less of Asian kids. That explains the difference in outcomes. It's not anything else but it's other than something. basic numbers. But, and, and but, the only but thing government would, can't do anything about Well, I, 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 here's what I will say. If the government was the source of the damage, the government can do something about it. So this starts with Lyndon Johnson in the United States. He was a president who took it you know, in the civil rights movement. Yeah. In the name of helping black people in America, he created a lot of programs, aid, etc., that created awful incentives. So there are literally women in the inner city in places like Chicago, where I've visited as part of this campaign, that are paid more not to have a man in the house than to actually be married and have that man in the house. So I don't even blame the individuals. The I blame so the, the system, system encourages this. Yes, yeah, and, and you want to know if is that's, call yeah. it systemic racism if you want, yeah. call it systemic failure if you want. But that's what the federal government can stop doing. Right. Don't use taxpayer money to pay people some, to do the opposite of what you should be doing. Some quick thoughts on yeah. the world stage. Uh, historic relationship, 1776, 1812, we had a couple of difficulties. But, yeah. <laughs> but, a, but a very strong relationship. We um, we've been desperately looking to do a trade deal between the UK and the USA. Uh, the Biden administration obstruct it constantly. Yeah. Would you be positive to that? Yes, depending on the terms, of course. But I do think that entering stronger bilateral trade relationships with our allies is a crucial step in declaring economic so independence you're, so you're from not, China. So you're not an isolationist? No, I'm not an isolationist, despite the media headlines. Uh, I'm not an isolationist. Not an isolationist? You're not part of Big Pharma, or are you? I challenge Big Pharma. My relationship to Big Pharma is the equivalent of Rumble's relationship to Big Tech, and I'm told, which is declaring independence. And I'm from. told you've been backed by Soros and many other, and you're a part of the WEF. And this oh, this is, is this is, is all laughable is stuff. Yeah. This is laughable, but, but it's good. You know, here's here's my view on it. First, I laughed at this stuff, but then I realized that people in this country have a good reason to be skeptical of anything they've been fed. Because we've been lied to time and again. And so I'm actually very sympathetic, even though I've answered these questions many times, yeah. to continue to do it. The World Economic Forum, let's take them. Nobody has been a bigger opponent of their agenda publicly, starting with my first book, than I have. So it's curious that my name then turns well, up. See, this is what happens. You put your head over the parapet, you start you to make some... Pro I've been there. You start to make some progress, and they fire everything they've got at you. They do, well, but the funniest part <coughs> is I did sue them. So I don't believe in just watching that and complaining about okay. it. I believe in action. I sued them in court, and we got everything we wanted, including a hard commitment that they would never do that to somebody again. You've been, well, yeah. you've been very supportive of President Trump yes. and what is going to happen in the jailhouse in, in, this afternoon in Georgia, in Fulton County, uh, which, which I see as a travesty as well. If he said to you, and let's assume that he comes through this contest and the polls are right, let's assume that he does win the nomination, would you be happy to be his VP? See, this isn't about me. If this were about me, sure, that's a fine position for someone to have at my age. This is about reviving our country, and I can only reunite this country if I'm doing it from the White House as the leader and the face of our movement. And what I will tell President Trump is, I know you're a patriot. I mean, he and I have deep relationship and mutual respect. I want him as my most valued advisor, something of a mentor in that role, actually. I've got fresh legs. I'm less than half his age. You're the rookie. I'm gonna, yeah, and, I, and I wear it as a badge of honor, but we have to reach young people who have lost their sense of national pride in this country. 60% of them saying they would sooner give up their right to vote than to give up their access to I TikTok. Know. I know. That's I a know. disaster. And so I, I think know. I'm the only person right. who can win in a landslide. Well, and I, think that's the I tell you what, thank you for coming on yeah. GB News. We're going to put this out. It's been out live. We'll put it out around the world. And I hope, folks, you now know who this guy is, because I think we've learned a hell of a lot.